Welcome to Purple Insider Extra Combine Edition. Matthew Collar is in Indianapolis. I'm Sam Ekstrom, joined by Hot Routes host, Paul Hodawanek, contributor to Purple Insider. Paul, what's up, man? Not too much. Yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't book Matt. He's just way too busy going to all the Combine parties, talking to all all the all his personal meetings with Kwesi Adafu Mensa and all that. I mean, he's just he's really hard to get right now. He's networking, that's for sure. He and Sage Rosenfels have been recording shows down there. So we're back on the home front, reacting to all of the quotes that that he is eliciting from Quasi Adolfo Mensa, Kevin O'Connell, et cetera, et cetera. And there's about 90 minutes of transcript from um, the side session and the podium session with the GM and the head coach. And Paul, I'm declaring it. The honeymoon is over. I mean, these guys are savvy and they're not going to give us a whole lot. They're not going to overcommit to any players or any directions or any philosophies. I mean, these guys are holding their cards pretty close to the vest. So you have to read between the lines here. Are there any quotes that caught your eye from the last few days in Indianapolis? Yeah, let's see if I can find the specific quote. It was a Quasi quote, I think from the side session in which he says like, we're not figuring out like our quarterback position for this year, or it's like for the next five years, basically. And the way I took that is, you know, they're thinking long-term about the quarterback position and where they're going to be. And I think the biggest thing that everyone was looking for coming out of this is what can we glean about what's going to happen to Kirk Cousins? And I don't know if there was one quote that you can pick out that says, this means he's staying or this means he's going. But the generalities in which Quasey talked about having met with the agent and the team is going to have to find a deal that works for them. And Kirk is going to have to find what works for him and that they have to think kind of long-term about this convinced me further that this team is either going to trade him or they're going to play out this last year of his contract and see how things go before committing really long-term. Uh, so that was maybe the quote and just the general vibe of the press conference. They said a lot of good things about Kirk and all of it's true. I don't think any of it was fabricated or said just to you know bump up his trade value i think everything that they mentioned about kirk is a fact about kirk and is a lot of the good things about kirk but it struck me as a a, a tandem that was that liked kirk cousins maybe not in love with them can isn't trying to just ship him out but also you know isn't trying to get down on one knee and propose to kirk cousins and make that their entire future so that was my general vibe i got from it are there specific things that you found in there you've been pouring over the transcripts a little bit more heavily than I have. So specific things that stuck out to you. Well, regarding Kirk, I felt like it was a continuation of what we've heard now for several weeks. Obviously O'Connell's been doing the media junket. He's given a million interviews and Adolfo Mensa has talked plenty as well. And I think no matter it, depending on which side you're on, you can kind of spin it whichever way you want. You can say, Oh, listen to all these nice things they're saying. They clearly like the guy. Or if you're where I stand, which is, team trade Kirk, you're seeing them refuse to commit to anything long term. They're only speaking in generalities. They're speaking in the present tense. And you can both at the same time say things that are true about Kirk and also seek to trade him. And when you're saying nice things about Kirk, maybe you're even bolstering his trade value if you make him seem unattainable. And that's what makes it really hard to, to gauge where the team is truly at and which side they're on. Um, there was a quote, too, that stood out to me on the defensive side of the ball that was very similar to the one you cited on the offensive side of the ball where um, Kwesi said that he wants to build a juggernaut. And he said that that's going to take three, four, five years. And, and what that tells me is that on the defensive side of the ball, there's not going to be any Band-Aids. There aren't going to be quick fixes like we saw last year where I was crunching the numbers on this. The Vikings signed 10 outside free agents last year. Nine of them were on defense. And of the nine, eight of them were one-year contracts. I mean, that's the ultimate quick fix, short-sighted team-building approach. I don't think they're going to do that this year. I think you're going to see a lot of um, in-house projects that get starting roles on defense. You're going to see rookies that they draft get roles on defense because they don't have the money, nor do they want to have that myopic approach building the defensive side of the ball. And I think that's why they, they've really done very little to convince me that this defense is going to be better this year. I think that it's more about a long-term build. Um, and if the offense is, can carry the team and be competitive next year, 
I think that's possible. They have the talent to do that, but I don't think this defense is making any quick turnarounds like, um, you know, like Ed Donatel in Denver had them go from 25th to third um, two years ago, but they had a lot more pieces than this Vikings team has. So I see a major defensive long-term rebuild on the horizon. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think generally this is what a new GM is going to come in and say. He's not generally it's all right. We need some time to make this look the way we want it. It's, you know, it's not guy. It, everyone on the roster is not someone that they've drafted, someone they've signed. So you would expect that they want to take their time. They want to build this thing up. And I think that's the prudent approach. If you have long-term success uh, on the mind is, you know, don't give out the one-year contracts to the older veterans. You got to invest in the youth you have, or if you're going to go out in free agency, invest in some maybe youth that you don't feel like was capitalized from other teams. And I think that's what you saw the Bengals do a little bit this year in free agency. They grabbed some guys that were younger, but had struggled at other previous stops. So they weren't super cheap, but they signed them to longer term deals and then they developed them and they turned out to be really good players. So that doesn't necessarily mean it they're not going to build some through free agency. I think it just changes what targets you might think they go after in free agency. Uh, yeah. Did you have something to add there? Well, I was just going to add on to that and say, I think it's going to be a hybrid approach. I think last year was free agency and only free agency. They just decided to bring in outside hired guns and try to get them to play together. And that didn't work well at all. I think a more measured approach would be find a blend couple free agents to, to add some at least veteran leadership, couple guys that you can elevate in-house, the Cam Bynums of the world, the, the Armand Watts of the world, and then a couple rookies. And then you build your defense that way instead of just going all in on these one-year contracts. I mean, I honestly, Paul, I don't know if any of them are going to be retained. The, the eight one-year contracts I referred to, they might all walk. And could you blame yeah. them or the team? No, you couldn't. So no. um, go ahead with that final thought that you had. Yeah, no, I, I was just going to bring up one more comment. Very small, but just a nice little wrinkle and kind of an X and, X's and O thing is O'Connell said he wants to be more multiple. I think that was a direct quote. Like, I hope to be more multiple here. Uh, and so the Rams, he's coming from a system that was predominantly um, 11 personnel. That was what they ran an overwhelming amount tops in the league, if I remember correctly. And mm -hmm. so I would still expect that to be a big, big part of their offense. But I think that opens the door for some guys that maybe we didn't expect to have a role. If CJ Ham's going to be still on the team, I think he mentioned CJ specifically too. Uh, and so I just, I think this isn't going to be just a retread of what the Rams did. And I think that was just kind of a, a interesting nugget here is I don't think this is going to be the exact Rams offense just coming up North to, to Minnesota. Yeah, the Rams were fairly extreme, too. I mean, they they used 11, 85% of the time last year, and they had some tight end injuries, which contributed to that. Um, the The interesting part of that is, is that the Vikings don't actually have two tight ends under contract right now. Not That's right now. the And they have for so many years, but they're going into this offseason with only Irv Smith. Tyler Conklin, to me, is out of their price range. Maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe I'm misjudging how the market views him. But I think based on tight ends that have signed elsewhere previously, I think he's too expensive. If they can bring him back and have a two tight end approach, great. But I'm not convinced that, you know, CJ Ham can be a full time tight end. I don't think that Zach Davidson, the former rookie, I don't know if he's ready to, to step into that role either. So they don't really have the pieces yet to do that. But there's a full offseason uh, to get that figured out. That's a Purple Insider Extra reacting to the Combine. You can check out all of our Combine content and free agency kickoff content at purpleinsider.substack.com. He's Paul Hodawanik. I'm Sam Ekstrom. Thanks for watching.